So welcome to the second day of the eighth year Three Plus Conference. Today is a very special day with a very special session. You're going to have pretty soon a Dean's discussion after our first day full of great debates, panelists, and work presented by students, faculty members, researchers from all around the world. Uh, in the first day we had uh, three parallel track sessions with lots of uh, papers and research being developed for from our students from Brazil, from France, from India, from Mexico, from Colombia, from Australia, from uh, uh, all countries related to CR3. We had also from France, uh, Japan, Netherlands. So it's a really big panel and really big conference. Com conference. We are really happy with that. So. Um, with no further comments, to now we'd like to hand the session for Matt Morsing. She is head of Prime, and it's a really pleasure to receive Matt here. So, Matt, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, moderate this uh, panel. I'm very happy to be here, and congratulations with such a um, a wonderful conference and so many participants from all around the world. I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm excited to for the dialogue we are going to have over the next hour about uh, the importance of interculturality as a driver for education. Um, my name is Mette Morsing and I am the head of Prime Principles for Responsible Management Education based in New York. And uh, I've been in this position for the last one and a half year and I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you and working very closely with uh, in particular you Gustavo for, for a long time and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, CRT3 here has been a long-standing supporter of Prime and actually uh, the very sort of um, start of, of your wonderful collaboration and this wonderful initiative came out of uh, the Prime community. So I'm particularly happy to be here today. So with us here today, we um, have the, uh, the pleasure of talking about the focus on culture today. Culture as the ideas, the customs, and the social behavior of a people or of a society. Culture is about what is acceptable conduct, uh, what are the guidelines for behavior, for the language, the way we speak with one another, uh, the expectations we have to one another in a society. And what we experience today in global society, in local, culture, in local society, is very much what I think we could call a monoculture, or what some talk about polarization of our societies, that sometimes, oftentimes, lead to conflict and not understanding each other. So today, uh, I'm very excited for, for this panel to actually talk about interculture, how we speak with one another across cultures, how we engage with one another across cultures and with those other strangers, if you like, that we do not know as we immediately meet them. And with me today to discuss this important topic, I have a prominent panel, a most prominent panel of three deans and one professor all long-standing supporters of Prime's mission of transforming management education and focusing on bringing sustainability and responsible management into the core curriculum of your four schools. And I'm delighted to say that all of you are from Prime Champion Schools and all four of you have a remarkable history working with interculture as a driver for education. So with me here today, um, I have Dean Karen Spence from Hankin School of Economics. And uh, uh, Karen, you are indeed a long-standing supporter of Prime, and you are the rector of Hanken School of Economics for many years. Uh, and you have also been in, in panels uh, with me before, and we've had the pleasure of uh, discussing sustainable development and the importance of responsible management uh, in use in, um, in, for higher education and for business school uh, education in particular. And I was also reading a little bit up on your bio, and you actually also some years ago served as the Dean of Education. So you, you come with that uh, long-standing understanding and, uh, and experience with uh, the importance of uh, education uh, in, for leadership uh, students into the future. 
With me, I also have here today Dean Christoph Gemmer from Audentia Business School. And Christoph, your business school, like Hanken, is also a longstanding um, supporter of Prime. And uh, I've particularly read your your uh, the report, the SIP report, the Sharing Information on Progress report that you have been working on, and that has served as a source of inspiration for many schools around the world, like. Uh, by the way, Hankin School of Economics report also has. You also bring a long-standing support to Prime and to the mission of, of education uh, with you, and you have served in your capacity uh, uh, in, in many councils and in many different capacities uh, around the world uh, for sustainable development and for business school uh, education. My uh, third uh, panelist uh, here today is Professor Dr. Vishwanathan uh, Lia, the and Dean of Academics at uh, TA Pi Management Institute uh, in India. And uh, you are uh, you are at um, me and uh, you have also over many years uh, worked with professional practice uh, and education at uh, in India and also uh, worked with uh, international collaborations and accreditations. Uh, in, in India and in graduate business schools, but also around the world, uh, where you have uh, been uh, a, a frequent visitor in different uh, universities, for example, in the United States of America. Lastly, but not leastly, welcome uh, to President Norman de Paula uh, Filo from ISAE. And, uh, um, you know, no. I think that uh, I don't need to introduce you so uh, much. Uh, we all know uh, you, Norman, and your long-standing uh, work with responsible management and sustainable development. You being one of the founders and uh, of Prime and one of the founders of the principles of Prime way back in 2007, where you were, were one of the uh, persons who actually developed Prime. And I'm happy to say that today you are also a strong supporter of Prime and in many capacities, for example, in your important capacity of being a board member of the Global uh, Prime Board. So a warm welcome to, um, to all of you here uh, today. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be leading this um, panel here with you. And I would like to start by inviting all four of you just to have three minutes talk about what you uh, see as the role of interculturality on forming the leaders for tomorrow. So Karen Spence, I would like to invite you to talk for three minutes uh, more or less about how do you see the role of interculturality on forming the leaders that we need uh, for tomorrow to address the global challenges. Please, Karen, the floor is yours. I met, uh, we, I'm sorry, uh, we missed uh, Karen on, on the session, oh, so. she's not yeah. here. Okay, but we will simply continue then. And please, uh, Christophe Germain from Audencia, can I ask you to uh, take the floor here with us and uh, talk about the importance of interculturality for, uh, for how we educate our students, please. Thanks, Meta. First of all, uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be part of, uh, of this discussion and to, to participate, to share uh, insight about inter interculturality. I think that uh, to, to start, interculturality is crucial, is fundamental for education between at the supra level, education contribute is a level to maintain the peace in the world. The first, the first, uh, and I think that it's the most important, we, we are, our mission is to educate people, to uh, allow them to work together. And for that, I think that the richness, richness um, doesn't come from similarity, but come from understanding others. And it is our mission to provide to our students an environment which uh, will allow them in the future to work with other people or other countries to avoid misunderstanding, to be able to take the 
most relevant decision because um, they will be uh, faced to different challenges and these challenges will cross um, different cultures, different uh, backgrounds, and they have, they have to understand uh, that. I think that it's fundamental. So for us, it's important to, um, as I, I said, to educate them, to, um, to educate them, to, to give to the ability to move into the world. Thank you very much for these first uh, remarks and for highlighting the importance of um, that we need to work with uh, avoiding, you could say, too much similarity, as you put it, uh, in order to create um, innovation that the world needs and that we have the responsibility as educators and as deans to create that environment. Um, let's get a little bit back to uh, when, when uh, in the discussion of how do we actually create such an important environment. It is my pleasure to, I'm sorry that I, I was not aware that Karen Spence was not uh, able to join us here today, but uh, of course we have the wonderful um, opportunity and I would li li like to uh, introduce you, Suzanne O'Keefe, here uh, participating. Uh, welcome, Suzanne, to the panel here. I'd like to introduce you as the next uh, speaker. Next speaker. You are a Professor of Economics and Acting Dean of La Trobe uh, Business School. And uh, we, some of us will know your work uh, in, in, this, in this space and also that you have worked very uh, meticulously with curriculum innovation, continuous improvement and review. And uh, I'm very pleased to have you here participating in this dialogue on interculturality. Uh, please, could you speak a little bit about how you see uh, interculture as a driver of education for our leadership students? Please, the floor is yours, Suzanne. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank for, thanks for your comments. Uh, so, at, look, I'm, I'm I'm relatively new in this in this role, but uh, I am uh, very familiar with the the work of uh, PRME, and um, I have been part of the business school for a long time. Um, so, as part of what what we do in terms of educating the leaders of the future, is um, to embed ideas of cultural intelligence and a global perspective across all of our courses. Um, and by that, I mean the ability to appreciate different cultural perspectives and the global context of one's discipline, but also the global context in which uh, decisions are made. And the idea of that is to uh, allow our graduates to confidently engage to build relationships and communicate with people from various backgrounds and cultures. Now, if we think about uh, our, in our business school, 40% of our students pre-COVID um, are international. Uh, with Australia's had uh, closed borders for some time. So um, our international students, we're, we're very much hoping they're coming back very soon. But with 40% of our um, students actually uh, international students, um, we have a very multicultural uh, group. In fact, in our bachelor degree students, um, our students were born in 97 different countries. So it's not just the students who are studying internationally, but Australia also has a very multicultural um, population. Approximately 30% of the school's academic staff were born overseas. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we work very hard to give our students an intercultural experience. And so we value cultural intelligence, global perspectives, um, responsible leadership, ethics and social responsibility. And in our education, we provide an environment conducive to living out those values and those values we think are crucial for the leaders of tomorrow. But it's very easy to fall into the trap of teaching about culture or teaching about interculturality rather than trying to activate it in the classroom. And we're very lucky that we have the diverse, um, co a diverse cohort of students. 
Um, and we do try very hard to sort of leverage that diversity uh, to uh, create more innovative learning techniques and to encourage the cross-cultural dialogue. Um, so look, I might leave it there, transmit and let someone else have a say. No, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for these introductory remarks and for emphasizing, you could say, the, the platform actually that you stand upon in your, in your school with a very diverse, as you say, diverse cohort of students and faculty coming from around the world. Um, thank you very much, Suzanne, for this. Uh, we will return to, to that uh, in our discussion a bit later. Now it's my pleasure to welcome you, Vish uh, Banatan. Please, uh, we no we've now heard uh, you know, some introductory remarks about interculture and the importance as a driver as interculture as a driver of education from France, from Australia, and now we turn to India. Please, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mente. And uh, it's fitting that, uh, you know, whatever Suzanne spoke, she sort of uh, laid the platform for me in the sense, you know, when we talk of India, geographically, of course, India is one country. But if you take a slightly larger view, it's an agglomeration of 30 odd states. It's like a Europe. I mean, if you think of Europe, entire Europe as one country with UK, France, Portugal, Italy as different states, probably that's what you know you would get India as. I mean, that's the uh, level of diversity that we have. It's both a challenge as well as an opportunity. Now, one very good thing about a lot of students here in India, I mean, people in general, I mean, when I refer to uh, people, I mean, people in general, not just these students, you know, you ask an average Indian or in this context, an average MBA student, how many Indian languages that you are comfortable, you know, speaking, reading, uh, having a meaningful conversation, you would be surprised the average answer would be five. You know, a average Indian would be uh, conversant would be capable of speaking, understanding at least minimum of three and average of five. Now, as I said, that's both a opportunity and a challenge. So what we had to do, I mean, over a period of time, we have a history of about 40 years uh, our business school. So we have consciously taken care that, you know, students on our campus represent at least 25 to 26 different states of India. So at any given point of time, a minimum of 25 different native tongues. Uh, you know, if I were to classify students on the basis of uh, the Indian native tongues, uh, I would have around 25, at least about 25 languages vibrant in the, uh, in the system. And uh, so what has been our endeavor I mean, I'll, I'll of course talk about it a little later. If I have to say in a nutshell, our endeavor has been, and I agree with Suzanne, there are a lot of things that you cannot teach them. You can create an enabling environment. So we consciously ensure that we create what we call as fast faculty advisory system, fast teams. Now this team of students, you know, a, a, a team of five and another five, five plus five, 10, typically this team of five students drawn from different parts of the country, they work together as a single team across an academic year, right? So there are many ways, this is one example, there are many ways systematically we ensure that uh, people from different uh, places, different regions, different backgrounds uh, get adequate opportunity to work together, be appreciative of each other's background and culture. So our motto is be self-aware and be culturally aware. In fact, we, we play, a, we, we put a lot of emphasis on self-awareness to begin with, to be aware of other, to be, uh, uh, to be appreciative of other culture, other than the culture in which I am born in. I need to be aware of myself. I need to start, you know, have a conversation from a position of strength, from a position of respect and not position of inferiority or superiority. So we make a lot of effort, of course, to what extent we succeed is a matter of detail. But honest, honestly speaking, we put in a lot of effort to make our students as much as possible be culturally self-aware and be aware of various culture, uh, you know, cultural diversity in which uh, they operate. So I will, we will take the conversation further. So that that would be my opening observation. No, thank you very much, uh, Viswanathan, for these opening remarks and for emphasizing 
uh, that India is not just one country or one culture, but actually many. And also for paying attention to the, the importance of language and that many Indian students actually carry three to five languages uh, with them, which I think is most unusual, actually, if we look upon the rest of the world. Uh, and I would love to talk a little bit more in our discussion about how to create that enabling environment for the self-awareness, the cultural self-awareness among students, because I think that is not something usually we teach our leadership students uh, that much. Uh, last but not least, uh, please, Norman uh, Aruda Filo, please over to you and your long-standing experience on working with creating leadership and excellent leaders for the world. Uh, how do you see the role of intercultural uh, interculturality as a driver for education? Okay, merci. Thank you. Uh, I'd like uh, before to make my, my opinion uh, to emphasize how important uh, your uh, participation in the CR3 Plus and uh, considering the leadership that uh, you have to with the, the our group of prime yeah, and uh, your uh, performance are a, a great recognition by all the groups all the schools all the members in different uh, countries and i think that uh, is a capacity that uh, you are doing in this uh, new uh, area. Yeah? But <clears throat> about the trans transculturality, uh, it's important uh, to recognize the, that becomes a strategy since it can boost projects and develop by the integration of institutions from different countries. This <clears throat> initiative promotes an exchange of different perspectives which can bring rich results where the participants rethink their planning and development. Uh, the exchange of experiences helps the uh, helps to implement the projects of a high level, high complexity, in a quick and economic way. It is emphasized this point to have uh, to consider that the development of abroad view that it takes into consideration cultural differences allows a high level of trust republics uh, within the project. Therefore, I would like to state that transculturality must be must be seen as a tool of enhance in the comprehension of sustainability. Considering that the implementation of the 70 SDGs is the biggest challenge of the United Nations members, the global partnership are essential to achieve the common goals. In my opinion, Prime acts as the main driver of integration of schools and it helps unify speeches. <coughs> the transculturality of the associations is also key strengthening the role are, uh, and the importance of the United Nations. And it is initiatives towards the global sustainable development 
And I think that we have to consider and to emphasize this importance. Uh, I think that this integration and uh, we have a strategic mission that is to, to fortify the prime income in integration with the global compact also. Thank you very much, Norman, for these introductory remarks and for emphasizing the importance of also creating trust in these intercultural uh, collaborations and in these uh, across cultural differences, and also emphasizing that uh, it, it is also working in high complexity environments that we need mm -hmm. our students to uh, understand how to do that, because that is, as you say, that is the reality once they become leaders of the world and they will have to work with sustainable the sustainable development goals which indeed introduces uh, a lot of complexity for our students so thank you very much panel for this first round of introductory remarks on the importance of interculture as a driver of education uh, i would now like to um, you know, invite you for a, a kind of a second round or for going a little bit deeper on, so how do we actually do this? We agree that interculture is important for our business schools, for our universities, for our students. Uh, and you are indeed here in CR plus three, you, you are indeed uh, yourselves uh, and your faculty and the conference that you organize here every year uh, is indeed a, a symbol of uh, wanting to have wanting to face, wanting to nurture that interculturality amongst scholars from around the world, which we see here today. But how do we do this in practical reality? And I would love to, to sort of get back um, actually to and, and start off uh, with you, Christophe, and ask you about how do you engage faculty members? How do you engage students um, to engage in intercultural exchanges and promote this inside the university? because this is also a highly complex uh, endeavor. Thanks, Meta. I think that the first action is to mix population. For example, at Odensia, 40% uh, of students are international and 60% uh, <coughs> of faculty come from abroad. So we are in an international environment. So uh, students, uh, faculty have the opportunity to discuss, to exchange, to work together and to understand others. Because as I said previously, the most important is to understand others. And I think, I think um, that, and I know that the, the past period with the outbreak um, was a little bit complex. Uh, in relation with this topic, I think that you cannot fully understand others by meeting them virtually. Mm. You need to meet physically people. You need to share um, moments of conviviality. Uh, you can read books. You can uh, share an online conversation, but you need to, to eat the food of a country to understand the culture. <laughs> and we are faced to a new challenge because we know that we need to reduce travels, flights, uh, travel. And, and, but in the same time, we know that students need to travel to, to go to, 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 to foreign countries, to live in the countries, to meet people, to understand others and to um, integrate interculturality. I think that it's our challenge in the future to find new ways to develop this interculturality uh, because it's fundamental in the education of, of students. Yes, no, thank you very much for pointing out the challenge that we actually have now in living in, you could say, virtual reality, if you like. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for the past almost two years now. Um, and so not least have our students, as you emphasize. Uh, do you have any examples, Christoph, on how do you actually at Odensia and beyond, how do you work with going beyond, you could sort of say, the, the virtual reality? <clears throat> how do you engage your students um, 
uh, uh, more in that physical reality. And I really like your your idea about we need you need to so your metaphorical way of putting this. You need to eat the food of a culture in order to understand <laughs> that culture. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. It's difficult to do it this. Really to, to, <laughs> we don't. No, we are lucky because this year, for example, in September we have welcome 95% uh, of our international students. So uh, uh, students can live in Tur and interculturality on site. Um, we look for different ways to, to, to develop alternative ways to, to, to promote interculturality, but it is not a, an, an easy task. You can uh, um, organize, for example, a, um, virtual dinners with uh, students from different countries. You can um, organize um, working groups, crossing uh, students coming from different uh, uh, schools of the world. But it's true that uh, it's not uh, fully convincing today. We need to, to find new ways. And but I, I'm sure because uh, we are very innovative, and I, I'm sure that in the future we will find this uh, this way. But uh, it's it's not an easy challenge. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's very important to think about how we can develop those novel ways of having our students meeting each other to understand each other, because we do see a polarizing society in some parts of the world, and we really need to work against that uh, as educators. Absolutely. Uh, oh, Suzanne, I would like to ask you, you know, you are you're based in, in, in Australia and uh, we, on a platform of, as you said before, a, a rather diverse cohort of students and of faculty. So how do you work with, uh, you know, making sure that your students um, also actually meet each other and engage with one another uh, on campus and beyond? Yes, it's a, I think it's a challenge for, for all uh, business schools and Particularly in Australia, I think if we're thinking about um, international the internationalisation of education, because of the distance, Australia is so far from from many other countries, and uh, it's expensive to travel. And many of our students um, are first in family at university, and uh, many of them come from lower socioeconomic groups and therefore don't have a lot of sort of financial resources. Um, so we, we are trying to think of novel ways, like as Christos says, it, it, it is quite a challenge. One, um, working groups across countries is, is one way that we, that, that, uh, we have used. Um, but the other thing I think because we have such a multicultural uh, environment in our university, um, cross-cultural understanding other cultures doesn't have to involve um, international exchange. In fact, if you have you know, a number of different cultures or like in India, you have a number of different languages uh, in any classroom, you can begin, I think, uh, to develop amongst students an appreciation for the value of alternative views, the value for alternative ways of um, ways of living, ways of thinking, different food. <laughs> we have lots of um, we have lots of uh, different uh, social gatherings on our campus that bring together um, students for the various um, kind of cultural celebrations. Uh, end of Ramadan sort of comes to mind. But you know that there are a whole range of things, and I think sowing the seed, sowing the seed of appreciation of other cultures, um, can happen within your country, uh, and then from there, students will be better placed to appreciate the differences between countries. Well, I think it's a very good point that you you raise about uh, also sort of being aware of the cultures within your country. And I know some of your colleagues in Australia are also working with, you could say, uh, with Aboriginals and having leadership students appreciate within your country, those, you could say, groups uh, that may not go to leadership education themselves and may be exposed to stigma and stigmatization even by, uh, by students, you could say, even by youth. 
uh, and how to work with that prejudice, how to work with those uh, appreciation, as you, as you rightly say, how to appreciate those other cultures within your own country is something that we, we may often forget. Yes, that's a good point, Rachel, and I was going to mention the um, importance of the Indigenous culture. Uh, I feel as if in Australia we, we are beginning to come to terms with that. Other countries like New Zealand and Canada have, have gone much further in embedding Indigenous culture within the entire education system. And uh, so I think we've got a lot to learn uh, from those countries in that respect. Yes, I think that's a that's a very good uh, very good point to. It's not just you could say the already privileged uh, uh, students we ha we have, but it's also those maybe underprivileged uh, uh, cultures in our own sort of vicinity that uh, that can be uh, put uh, an emphasis on for our leadership students uh, to to learn how to appreciate other cultures. Thank you, Susan, for this. Over to you, Vishwanathan. I mean, again, India, multi multicultural society, also with a lot of different uh, cultures, uh, socio-economic cultures uh, as well. So how do you, in practical reality, uh, engage with uh, nurturing such interculturality? So thank you. And to build on uh, both my previous speakers, right? See, there is a science to it, and there is an art to it. So the science part of how we go about doing our thing is A, of course, you know, we look at uh, the background from where we pick our students. So as I said, you know, when we have so much of diversity, it is both a challenge and an opportunity. So the first thing that we do at the stage of admission itself, we try and ensure that not more than 8% of our students, you know, the maximum 8% could be from one state or one particular regional background. So not more than a maximum of 8%. Even then, accommodating 25 to 28 different states and people with background and value systems uh, is a challenge. So one way of doing it is we put a embargo there. Second, once we have picked in students, uh, over the last five years, we have also started bringing in, uh, you know, a lot of scholarships, as uh, Susan said, uh, and, and it is more true for Indian context, we have students coming in from various economic strata of the society. So there are many uh, bright students, but, you know, difficulty in uh, ensuring that they are able to afford the kind of fee, uh, the private school demands in this day and age. So we have increased uh, our scholarships. So this is one way of ensuring that, you know, students from various strata of society, bright students, good scores, uh, background work, uh, work experience, we are able to get them on board, right? Right at the stage of admission. So, so this, is, this is the initial science part of it. So once having ensured that we have a decent mix of students, you know, in terms of gender, regional background, educational diversity. So that is, we have engineers and, you know, people coming from different, different educational background. The next thing is from the associate dean's office, we ensure that right on day one, we create these small working groups. So teams of five and two such teams comprising of a, a group of 10 students, right? So here we ensure that these are as diverse as possible. In fact, you know, we learn in uh, cluster analysis that you create clusters which are uh, internally homogeneous, but are very different from each other. So if you have, let's say, cluster one and cluster two, a cluster one and cluster two should be very different from each other, but internally very homogeneous. Our way of approaching creating groups is exactly anti-cluster, I would say. So a, a, a group of students is as heterogeneous as possible within a given group, but across groups, they are as homogeneous as possible. So if my one group of 10 students have, uh, let's say about four female candidates, the other one also has, you know, a comparable, uh, you know, in terms of gender diversity, regional diversity, the number of languages spoken, background they come from, economic strata, as much as possible, we try and pack it. Again, there is a limit to which we can, you know, uh, tweak uh, these statistics, but we try our best to see, you know, uh, one challenge that you realize 
that human beings are integers you know human beings are not fraction i cannot have a 1.3 student in one group you know uh, coming from one culture so that's that's as far as creating groups are concerned the next part is in terms of curriculum there are different ways we have made some attempts to bring in uh, this awareness for uh, different cultures respecting different cultures and practically integrating it into their decision making process so the way we go about it we have introduced it's been uh, this is our fourth year three years ago we consciously decided to include a social practicum that is every group of this 10 students as i said they work with a social enterprise or an arm of a government or an ngo so they work with uh, bodies which have business problems challenges which is nece not necessarily coming from uh, you know a very uh, rich background so here what happens when students work with such groups social enterprises with uh, farmer producer organizations with ngos they also learn uh, how to deal with other uh, stakeholders in the society who are not necessarily uh the listed entities of the corporates right so that awareness of that even those entities have business problems while they may not have all the resources probably uh, an snp 500 company would have but even these entities have serious business problems even they have accounting problems hr problems marketing problems so how do you uh operationalize or how do you you know come up with solutions which are applicable in those contexts so this is a very important experience so this is a project that runs over uh, close to 100 hours in the first year and so a they work as a team and as i said uh, this region where the students congregate this has a different language so we we consciously ensure that at least out of 10 student there is one student who can speak a local language that otherwise uh, you know you may be surprised that within groups they may need a translator it's not just international within within these groups you may need a translator and often english and hindi serve as the link language across uh, these students so this is you know you give them projects the next is we consciously bring in as many cases as possible so we use a variety of cases harvard cases darden cases right uh, a variety of i mean cases now we consciously try and pick those academic material teaching material in such a way that there is an element of uh, culture there is an element of ethical dilemma there is an element of appreciating uh, the value differences right so in varying proportion not all courses are amenable for this this approach or into but we try our best to see there is a healthy dose of such content that gets in in the form of cases right mm -hmm. uh, we also have international immersion for our students now the last couple of years you know covid being a reality we couldn't have all of our students on campus at least the last 3 months we have been able to bring in a large chunk of students back on to our campus so we operate as a bubble so once the students are in these uh, 300 400 or students who are currently on campus they cannot step out mm -hmm. so we have created sort of a bubble within the campus and uh, you know create an environment which is as safe as possible now in good old days pre covid days uh, we had the immersion international immersion and opportunity for uh, the students to go abroad so we used to traditionally take students to middle east region so that's another area where you have a lot of opportunity to see people from different uh, you know regions businesses even businesses uh, owners of indian origin operating there it it gives them an opportunity to understand so multiple ways societies there are many clubs uh, about 26 odd clubs that operate within the campus so again students you know that gives them an opportunity to uh, work with another we appreciate so this is i would say we try a lot of things that's a that's an amazing uh, plethora of uh, activities that you put on on actually to sort of nurture this uh, sense for one another and as as i was listening to you speaking i was just thinking about when i was a professor at stockholm school of economics and i entered that school and uh, you know the the dean welcomed me and i was reading you know what are the values actually at the school and this is a sort of uh, uh, one of the values was actually empathy so one of five values core values uh, for that school is actually how we mm. educate our students to have a more empathetic approach to business and also to one another and i thought empathy 
Uh, I don't think I would have heard that 10 years ago, but empathy is indeed something that I hear more and more when I speak with deans. And I really appreciate it because that is very much what we're talking about here today. How do you enable students to step into the shoes of the other uh, and to understand reality, understand also business reality from the perspective of that other person? And that's not that's not an easy or trivial matter. It is something we, we need to work with, as you, as you very well said. With Vanessa in a, in a multiple uh, sort of number of ways mm -hmm. uh, and I would now give over the word to you Norman but I would and, and then I would like all, all you know my excellent panel here just to think about you know what is the most important thing the one most important thing we can achieve uh, as we foster interculturality and I will take that for a very final sort of round uh, before we close here in, 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 in a few minutes but over to you Norman how do you I mean again based on your long-standing work with sustainable development and with you know in a, in a context of interculturality how do you even foster that interculturality and understanding of the other more please okay uh, i think uh, matt is is necessary before to analyze and to discuss each point about this subject i think that it is necessary uh, both teacher and student have to look at themselves and uh, understand their collaborative and self role. They must reflect about uh, self knowledge to then uh, strengthen their responsible uh, relationships and the collectivity. Only theory no longer know, uh, uh, know uh, uh, this, this concept. The movement of the schools needed is to outside the classroom. Uh, we have to analyze uh, the, the culture uh, of the city, of the, the high level of interference that we have and uh, that the professor have to integrate with the community to bring not only the results of the researchers, but uh, to invite ex-students that uh, were subjects, that were students of uh, the schools, to bring it to the school to analyze what is the result, so what are the best uh, 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 activity that they developed, that they and how they are uh, managing the reality that they uh, uh, were inspired by the school. And I think that uh, we have uh, several subjects, for example, uh, their ability of social articulation and mobil mobilization, uh, their capacity of problem solving, their dedication in producing research that seeks better results, not only personally, not only to the school, but uh, including to the market, to the society, uh, and mainly their competences in generating knowledge within the academy, but for the society. I think that uh, these points are essential in, in this movement that we believe and uh, uh, it is exactly what mobilize activities as the CR3 plus and other activities. Mm -hmm. uh, this partnership that we have with several uh, schools, it is fantastic uh, to integrate with uh, 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 Australia, with <coughs> France, with uh, uh, India, uh, it was fantastic uh, the integration that we made the, uh, uh, with India in two big events that we have to participate there. 
Né? And it was fantastic to analyze what has the impact that the education caused in the great evolution of industry in India. It is fantastic to analyze this one. Né? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, this uh, example can be used as a reference for us. We have this capacity to identify, to analyze, and try to implement. Yeah? Yes. I think that it is a very special lesson. Yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you for these uh, comments and these remarks, Norman, and, and, and yourself, this very context, this very conference being an outstanding uh, example of exactly that. And I think also I'm impressed to know that you have also shown a certain insistence and persistence, not least, because yeah. this is the, eighth, the eighth time actually that you are you. celebrating this conference. And I think that is also in itself remarkable. Uh -huh. yeah, I'd now like to invite all the my wonderful panelists here for final, just you know, final two, one, two sentences about what is the most important thing we can achieve uh, to. Uh, foster the interculturality that we're talking about in this pen. What is the most important mm -hmm. thing? Christoph, please, over to you first. Okay. <laughs> I think that the interculturality and the multiculturality, it is the first step that you, you, we have to integrate and to fortify the level of education yes. in, in each place. In it, uh, it is necessary to stimulate and to recognize the best practice to integrate the schools. I think that is necessary. It's not so difficult. It, 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 and it is easy to identify the best practice and to integrate with in, in, in terms of cooperation with the other schools and then to <coughs> check what is the best way to implement, what the criteria that we have to establish to evaluate. Oh, it is fantastic. We had a, a, a program with the, the, the school in France, uh, the, 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 now, uh, um, what is the, the school or, 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 um, that, uh, that the, 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 the director now is another uh, uh, leader of the, the uh, Another uh, another uh, uh, position that uh, the leader is uh, uh, occupying, mm -hmm. and it is fantastic. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we establish a cooperation with him. Yes. And uh, why? Because he was a very he was a very good thing, uh, 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 and the leader of the metropolitan area of Nantes, for example. Uh, oh, it is, it is fantastic, this. We have to learn that, uh, yeah, and it is exactly what I used to say, that the classroom is important. Yes, it's important. But don't forget that the classroom can be used to put in practice. Yes, that's it, very, very true. So, yeah. so, yes, so that collaboration, I think, is what you're emphasizing. That collaboration is not so difficult. We just need to, you could say, go out and actually make it happen. And you have indeed shown that. So now over to you, Christoph. But what is the most important thing we can achieve by uh, interculturality? Uh, in summary, I think that, yes, yes, I think that the best important is to convince young people that the richness comes from diversity and interculturality and that to take to make good decision to understand others you have to be able to put yourself 
in the place of your interlocutor. Yeah. And for that, in intercularity is fundamental. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, Christophe. Susan, over to you. I think that the most important thing that we can teach our students um, who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow is respect. Respect for other cultures, other ideas, other ways of doing things. Thank you very much, Susan. Viswanathan, I will give you the last word here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let me build on all what my colleagues have said. See, like with any body of knowledge, when we teach and learn, right? Mm -hmm. So there are three levels. One is the knowing, doing, and being. You know, teaching students or making them aware of multiculturality is one thing, but getting them to see how it matters in real life in the kind of decisions that they make. So you create environment for them, create opportunities for them through which they get to operationalize and put to practice. And we also try, you know, uh, let's say those, uh, we have about 300 plus uh, corporate partners. So diversity, D&I &I is, is a big thing. It is no longer something which is, you know, merely mentioned in the websites of uh, an enterprise. So we get senior uh, practitioners from the industry to come and share their d and experience, how diversity and inclusion within their organization has made a change in the way they look at their processes internally, as well as how they conduct amongst themselves, how they deal with their clients. So it's, it's, it's a multifaceted thing. So one is Thank knowing you. about it, Right. Second is being and then doing. So that's that's how I would I would look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to this fabulous, wonderful panel for one hour of discussing how interculturality is and should be even more a driver for the education and coming up with many great examples for inspiration for the rest of us of how do we actually make that happen in practical reality. Thank you, uh, Viswanathan Laya uh, at from, from uh, Manipal, uh, India. Thank you to Norman uh, from, from Isaiah, Brazil. And thank you to you, Suzanne, from La Troupe, uh, Australia, and to you, Christophe, from Audencia uh, in, in France. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Meta. Thank you, Meta. Thank you, Meta. Thank you, everyone. We are now moving to the next session. Uh, next session. So I, we just shared on chat the links. So have a great day. Enjoy the conference. Enjoy the pair of sessions. And we see you in the closing. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.